Charlie Lorenz here in front of the courthouse with Rod Jones. And Rod, can you uh, spell your name, please? Uh, Abman. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's my AKA. <laughs> yeah. Rod Jones, R O D J O N E S. And uh, what is the purpose of uh, for your visit here in front of the courthouse? Well, everybody in Mendocino Abalone Watch seemed to have a feeling that we need to draw attention to the fact that the fines on abalone are in some instances way too low and they're erratically applied at times um, and they don't seem to be really serving their purpose as best as they could in terms of preventing and deterring poaching. Uh, people get hammered after the fact, but we want to let people know that if they're out there and they are poaching, they keep taking one more, one more, one more, those fines are going to go up drastically and it may end up in jail time. Glass Beach that can have, in, in three or four days, it can have 3,000 abalone taken out of it uh, by rock pickers getting up early in the morning in a very low tide or a so-called minus tide. And so that's a real problem. But I think, and really I think the difficulty is that there are a lot of larger abalone that have some security because they're they're in deep enough water that people cannot free dive to get them. But all of the ones that are in the intertidal zone um, or in shallow waters are, are just vulnerable. And that's, they tend to be younger ones that are barely at seven inches. And the concern is that whole population of young abalone may be getting removed and picked over. So we'll be left with a lot of so-called elderly abalone that are not and cannot reproduce. And a lot of young ones that don't have much of a chance because they're getting plucked when they're only seven inches. I was at Jug Handle Beach, Jug Handle Reserve about a month ago and encountered three fellows and one of them ended up having three abalone, two of which were undersized and they were ready to just stick them in their backpack and, and head out the door. So I just happened to be there and happened to be on patrol that day and found these fellows and I basically gave them the choice that either I can go back to the car, get a phone, get a warden and then they can suffer a $2,000 fine or the other alternative I was prepared to give them was they could turn around as I watched them and they could take those abalone that were undersized back in the water and put them back exactly where they found them. And they, they opted for the latter. I used to dive for abs myself. I saw a lot of people taking them illegally and high grading them and doing various things and I figured it was time to put a stop to it. I want the fines to be equal. Um, reading in the court report, I see People with one ab over the limit find 1600 and some dollars, yet there's another one with one ab over the limit and it's turned into an infraction and I believe they were fined $600 and I want to know why. I have seen a woman pick up an ab and then drop it about six feet behind her came her an older gentleman and picked it up. Fish and game popped up out of the tall brush and they asked if we saw the same thing and so it was good that we were able to back up fishing game letting them know we saw the same thing. I just think our presence out there keeps it down quite a bit. Uh, I did have an interesting uh, conversation just yesterday with a, a guy that came down from Eureka. Uh, he said he's just trying to get into learning something about catching abalone that he doesn't know anything but he was up in the area near Westport and was looking around had no luck and as he was going out he um, met some guys going in and they s talked and they said well come on with us we know where to find them and they went into a spot they had been just the day before that was loaded with them there wasn't a one left. I worked for the uh, Mendocino Beacon and the Fort Bragg Advocate News and I do the court report for those two papers. We're for a standardized fines. Uh, anyone who is for standardized fines would have died in there today. They've dismissed cases for no reason. Because one out of three pleads guilty, they dismiss the other two for that plea. Uh, many are being fined like one over and the next person called will have one over and they'll have two different fines sometimes seven hundred dollars apart and uh, so it's just keystone cops in there today we do have a visiting judge so i i will cut him some slack at that point mm -hmm. but uh it's discouraging and it 
Well, no, that's the wrong word. It makes me angry. One case, there were three over. Two of them had three over. There were three of them did, a piece. And he said, would you cut them to uh, plus one today? And he said, yeah, sure. So I sat down with Judge Leanne one day and I said, why don't we penalize them according to state law? We always give them the minimum. Why don't we give them the, at least the minimum mandatory in here? Well, he said that usually comes from the DA's office. If they came and said that's what they want, that's what I would do. I went straight to the DA's office, talked to Tim, who is a good friend of mine, Tim Stone, deputy DA, and he said, we'll start Monday. And s since that day till now, we've tried to go by the bail schedule and try to assess fees and penalties uh, and probation length and loss of license either for the term of probation or for life in, in commercial cases. Uh, and repeat offenders get tougher treatment. For taking 13 abalone, you're commercially fishing. The state law says they are to be fined a minimum of $14,000, mandatory minimum, up to $44,000. Hmm. You can find them anywhere in there. Yeah. Now what the court does is find them fifteen k, and then suspend 10000 of it. Or suspend, one, one case I remember, they suspended uh, 14500 right. So the guy had to pay $500. Yeah, yeah. And they met the state mandatory minimum by doing that. We've had some people six times caught. That means they got by with it about 60 times. We talk about tougher penalties. I think just enforce the ones we have would, would do the job. I, yeah, I've been, uh, been working uh, Glass Beach area quite a bit this year, and, uh, or this last season, and uh, it's amazing how many abalone are coming out of that, uh, uh, that part of the, of the ocean. Do you think it's uh, uh, hurting the environment there, I mean, as far as the population of abalone? Definitely. There is areas there that uh, uh, there's empty shells and a lot of the crevices there, they're, they're stacked up, so that tells you there's a lot of them that are popping them out of the shell, and then how they're hiding them is beyond me. Oh, I think there's a need for a tremendous amount of uh, public education, both education of the divers and the rock pickers who are taking the abalone, but uh, education of the public as well, so they understand a little bit more about the, the resource that's here, what we've got, and how thin that resource is in some respects, uh, and the importance of trying to keep that resource available. And I think a place which, which could serve as a kind of clearinghouse of information that gives sound information about what the abalone resource is and tells people as well how it's okay to take it, how it's not okay to, to overtake it, and the, the right and wrong ways of taking the abalone, how to remove the abalone, all of that, uh, I think would be real valuable even for people that are not involved in taking abalone, but maybe seeing other people if they can become more aware of what's appropriate and what's not. So a place where someone could go for all of that information in one location would be a really valuable asset. <laughs>